It's November 2002, and NBA legend Magic Johnson is suiting up against his former college team, the Michigan State Spartans. Welcome home, Urban Magic Johnson! Magic's just been inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame and immediately turns back the clock to put on a show, throwing lobs, no-look dimes, and effortlessly running the fast break. What's just as wild is that Magic's doing this as an honorary member of the Canberra Cannons, an Australian team that competes in the country's National Basketball League, or NBL, for short. The Cannons are a storied franchise back in Australia. They've been around since the league's inception in 1979 and even won three titles back in the 80s. And there's the Hooter, Canberra win the championship. But only one month after returning home from this historic game with Magic, the Cannons franchise is abruptly shut down. All, all the emotions flood through, like we, we're, we're finished, we're done, we're fired, we've got no jobs, money stops, and all of that stuff hit us instantly. Hard break for Cal Bruton and the Cannons. Yeah, that's, that was just a whole new level of disappointment. But what if I told you that what happened to the Canberra Cannons wasn't all that unique? Because in its history, the NBL has had some serious issues keeping teams on the court. Over 20, yeah, over 20 franchises have folded in the league's history. People might rattle off a bunch of reasons why they think that basketball has never really taken off here in Australia, be it our small population, the competition from other sports like cricket, Aussie rules football and rugby, our lack of large venues and even the battle for media coverage. And those are definitely all factors, but they aren't the main reason experts think the sport has struggled down under. Yeah, I think the, many of the NBL clubs have been mismanaged over time and, and that has led to there was a period of real instability within the league where it actually looked like the league wasn't going to continue. Here we go, Richard! Here's the way to finish the half. James Harvey almost out of sport. He put up the play and what a way to get the crowd on their feet. It's uh, going to be a very exciting year for basketball. And if this National League does get off the ground, uh, it could be really big things for basketball in general. It's 1979 and the Illawarra Hawks are tipping off for their first ever game in Australia's brand spanking new National Basketball League. You might recognise this guy, NBA All-Star LaMelo Ball. He'll later play for the Hawks in 2019 before getting drafted by the Charlotte Hornets. But all the way back in 79, the fledgling Hawks might not know it, but they're special. They'll eventually become the only founding team in the NBL that's still afloat today. But what all of the NBL's failed franchises lacked in longevity, they usually made up for with uniquely Australian names and mascots. Teams like the West Sydney Razorbacks, Townsville Crocodiles, and who can forget the West Adelaide Bearcats? Well, probably most people, but you know, back in 1979, this was just an exciting time for basketball down under. It was a huge moment in basketball in, in Australia because basically it meant you got your best players playing each other on a more consistent basis and it meant the Australian team would be the, the major beneficiary. If you follow the Australian boomers uh, progression, it starts to happen pretty much straight after, um, after that inauguration of the league in 79. The NBL was so successful out of the gate that teams from across the country couldn't wait to jump on board and be part of the action. And in just five years, the number of teams had grown from 10 to 17. The problem was these teams were small clubs with little to no financial resources and really weren't up to the task of making that ascension to the National League. Think of it like a minor league baseball team or even lower, suddenly getting thrown into the majors with no safety net. These were all club teams that were based in suburban stadia that were seating 350 people. And just, just the costs involved of traveling around Australia, uh, I think a lot of people bit off more than they could chew. They thought, yeah, we want to be part of this. And then when they became part of it, found, my God, this is a lot more expensive than we realized. By the end of the 80s, the NBL had already lost seven teams. 
But after that challenging first decade, the league really started to make waves by the early 90s, once teams started moving into bigger and better venues, which made games look way better on TV, which helped increase the audience and the money that came with it. You know, in, in 1987, we were, we were terrible. And playing in front of 600 people and then you know, four or five years later, we're at the tennis center playing in front of 15,000 people. Uh, such was the growth of the game over a relatively short period of time. To be quick. He shoots and gets the three -pointer. So some of those games, I rem distinctly remember a, a Melbourne Tigers Sydney Kings game. We packed out the Melbourne Tennis Centre at 15,000, and we would do that regularly. Probably the rookie year in Sydney, uh, we'd pack out the Entertainment Centre in Sydney 90% of games, and it was just just such a fun place and fun time to play. Despite finally seeing some success, the NBL was not out of the woods yet though, because with more success came more money, and that started to create an uneven playing field. The growth of the league was, was so sudden and, and so impactful that the, a lot of the people involved in administration and management of, of clubs really weren't up to what, what was required in terms of business models, etc. And, and then rich clubs started to spend more money on their, their imports, you know, salary caps became a factor, but then people were cheating the salary cap and basically everyone was doing their darndest. To, to win a championship or buy a championship and, and several clubs started to fall by the wayside simply because financially they just couldn't meet the level of commitment that was now required to compete with the bigger city teams. But the NBL's success would kind of end up backfiring according to Body Nodge. He says the Australian Football League, or AFL, was so determined to not be overtaken by basketball that they started scheduling games at the same time as NBL ones. This impacted viewership and overall media coverage of the league and wasn't helped by NBL teams continuing to spend beyond their means in the hopes of winning a title. And like that, the golden era had kind of come to a close. We head to Melbourne as the Tigers take on the Canberra Cannons. A lot of teams that have pulled out of the league over the years actually still exist today. They just compete in lesser local leagues. I'm looking at you, West Adelaide oh, Bearcats. Wow. <laughs> but that team that Magic Johnson played for that one time, the Canberra Cannons, well, they didn't even get that. And we're going to learn a bit more about the sad story of the Cannons' demise and what it says about the volatility of Australian basketball. So by the early 2000s, the Cannons had fallen on tough times. The team had played out of the Australian Institute of Sports Arena, nicknamed The Palace, since the early days of the league. But it hadn't kept up with the bigger venues other teams were playing in, which severely limited the franchise's ability to generate enough revenue to balance the books, plunging the team into debt. And a real lack of success on the court wasn't helping things either. Canberra's fairy tale season finish will come to a close at Melbourne Park. We weren't doing great off the court. We, you know, we'd struggle for a naming rights sponsor and finally get one. And um, some of those early training sessions, you could just sense the feeling that um, we were sort of skin of our teeth type stuff and just getting through. We weren't necessarily recruiting as good a player as we as we probably needed. Um, and you could sort of sense that that was probably a money issue as well as a on-court success issue. But in the middle of all of this uncertainty for the Cannons, the opportunity of a lifetime would end up arriving in the form of old mate Magic Johnson, who was looking to put together a squad to go against his former college team, the Michigan State Spartans, for an exhibition game to commemorate his entry into the Hall of Fame. Magic reached out to then Cannons coach and NBL Hall of Fame player Cal Bruton with the offer to send the team stateside and even suit up for them as a one game only honorary Canberra Cannon. And in November of 2002, the Cannons made history. We, we heard rumours that it was going to happen and couldn't believe it. Um, it, it, was, it seemed too good to be true. I mean, playing um, with Magic Johnson uh, at uh, Michigan State University against their current team. Magic showed up at shoot around that Friday morning, um, learned our plays really, really quickly. Um, we sat around and had a chat. Most of us, the, the younger guys, were in awe of just being around him. Yeah, it was super, super exciting as a fan. But uh, then the game showed up 
big crowd, student section, just like I'd experienced in college. Some of the other guys on our team hadn't experienced a college atmosphere before. But that, that game was amazing, absolutely amazing. The Cannons didn't know it, of course, but that last game with Magic would end up being the franchise's last great moment. Because everything from then on would be nothing short of bad news for its players and fan base. After the game at Michigan State, the team flew straight back to Australia to rejoin the NBL season. But only weeks later, one day in late December, players and coaching staff were called to the team's practice facility for an emergency meeting. There was just one, one day that we got called into the office and it was out of, out of hours, it wasn't the normal practice time. And we just got called into an office here in, in, in Tuggeranong. All the, the front office staff were there, coaches were there, we we're, were all there. And there was also one extra, uh, an, a, a man sitting there in a suit who inter introduced himself as a liquidator administrator. Um, as an accounting uh, student at the time, I kind of knew what that meant. The words coming out of his mouth were to the effect of, I've had a look at your books, uh, I think you guys are insolvent and accordingly uh, you guys have been placed into administration by, by head office, uh, voluntary administration. They had a meeting, they called us in and said, that's it, <laughs> it's over. And just like that, so everybody was just shocked. Like just, we knew something wasn't right, but that's okay, we're gonna take care of our business. We didn't, hit, we didn't think we were, were not gonna be able to play. Yeah, that's, that was just a whole new level of disappointment. The, the instant part of it was, yeah, income stopped. We had, we had no, no revenue coming in as of essentially that time. So it was hugely emotional in a bunch of different ways. Um, anger, fear, um, worry, like is my NBL career over after one year and a handful of games? All of those things in a, in a, in a whirlwind coming straight out of that conversation. So it was, it was intense, scary, um, yeah, it was nuts. You know, realistically, I think it was a week before Christmas. I think it was something like the 18th of December that it all happened. So the uncertainty just absolutely smashed everyone from, you know, the head person all the way down to the, the team manager role. Um, and the uncertainty was what killed you. After their unceremonious mid-season exit, it then became a salvage operation. Could the team find a new owner? And would that new owner even want to keep the team in Canberra? The Cannons eventually returned to the court to finish out the season in a gruelling compressed schedule and were soon sold to a group based in the nearby city of Newcastle. After reaching its low water mark with near extinction and seven straight losses, things are looking up for the Canberra Cannons. And only a week after the end of the season, it was announced the new ownership group would be packing up and moving the team to, you guessed it, Newcastle and would be renamed the Hunter Pirates. We kind of knew that it was going to be the last hurrah. The last night here in, in Tuggerong was, was pretty tough. We'd played most of the rest of the season out of the AOS, at AOS Arena, and you know the, we couldn't even get that venue for the last game. So it was, it was pretty, pretty tough way to, to end the, uh, the Cannons' life. But, uh, but again, as, as players, you got a job to do. You love playing. You're given an opportunity to play, so, so that's what you did. Cam Rigby joined the Hunter Pirates after their move from Canberra and from day one he knew something was off about the way the new team was being run. Lots of really big promises and, and very little professionalism from the ground up. I mean we, we showed up to training the, the first couple of days, had no training uniforms. So just the, the, the bare necessities of running a basketball team um, weren't met. For a little while we had jerseys but no shorts. Well, the jerseys had no numbers on them, so literally our first couple of uh, pre-season scrimmages, pre-season training games, played without numbers, and a couple of times they even wrote uh, numbers on, with texture on our arms, like, like, like junior basketball tryout days. Um, so it was really uh, unprofessional, really, really amateurish. Um, so we, we, we knew it didn't start too well. The Brisbane club cruised to a 17-point win against the Hunter Pirates. It was the Bullets' third win in a row, while the fledgling Hunter club has just one win from 16 starts. Last night's was its ninth consecutive defeat. By 2015, the league had fallen into one of the most troubling financial positions in its history, with many teams either burdened with debt or struggling to barely break even each year. 
With the league in desperate need of an injection of cash, Melbourne-based real estate mogul Larry Kesselman swooped in to purchase the league for just $7 million. For me, when we took over, I really wanted to squarely put the focus on what business are we in, what is the actual sport about, uh, and give it the uh, attention it deserves and build it into a sustainable business. If you cannot make clear, concise and quick decisions, uh, that's a formula for a disaster. And, and unfortunately, over many years under ownership of uh, whether it's the clubs themselves or Basketball Australia, uh, that has always proven hard. So that's a small slice of the sorry story of Australian basketball so far. But with a new owner and a new outlook, is the NBL actually safe from falling back into instability? Although Larry Kesselman's arrival brought a steady hand, teams that had been struggling before the change of ownership weren't able to weather the storm. And only a year later, the Townsville Crocodiles became the most recently defunct NBL franchise, bowing out of the competition after 23 seasons. But despite some instability with certain teams, the overall trend for the NBL seems positive. In 2019, the high-profile signing of young American prospects like LaMelo Ball and RJ Hampton drew international attention to the league, and soon after, the NBL signed a record TV deal with ESPN. But the economics of the NBL are still small fish compared to the NBA. The Perth Wildcats sold in 2021 for a reported $8.5 million price tag. And in comparison, the majority stake in the Phoenix Suns just sold for a reported $4 billion. But that doesn't mean NBA insiders aren't still interested in the potential of the league. A long list of current and former NBA players have recently been buying ownership stakes in some teams, including John Wall, Chris Middleton, and Andrew Bogut. And on a recent trip down under, Shaquille O'Neal even expressed interest in buying into the league and advocated for getting an NBA game played on Australian soil too. Everyone knows Shaq loves Australia. Things have turned around so dramatically that the league's sights are now set on expansion with the addition of the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix in 2018, and more recently, the Tasmanian Jack Jumpers, who even made the grand final in their maiden season, ultimately getting swept by the Sydney Kings. The return of professional basketball in Tasmania required a significant campaign from the NBL to get Hobart's aging arena upgraded and capable of generating enough revenue to make the team viable. Identifying markets that'll deliver a consistent and passionate fan base is the league's top priority now, which is probably a level of strategic planning that it was missing in the past. Game over. Love it. Love it. Great for Tasmania. The success of the Jack Jumpers model has also reignited speculation that the NBL might be looking to do the same thing here in Canberra. The biggest hurdle is that the Australian Institute of Sports Arena, you know, the Palace, isn't fit for purpose for a professional team. It was closed at the start of the pandemic, but never reopened because of its inadequate fire safety of all things. Upgrades aside though, the NBL says the Palace isn't fit to host a team because it can't fit enough people to make a team viable, and that an entirely new arena in the middle of Canberra is the answer. Our willingness and uh, our momentum is certainly a positive one. We think Canberra deserves to have NBL games being played. I think there's a huge supporter base, fan base, participation base. Uh, it's the capital of the country. So for us, not to have uh, get NBL games in Canberra is, uh, is negative. But the ACT government is adamant that the Palace could still fill that role once it's upgraded, even though the league says otherwise. For NBL legend Andrew Gaze, the lack of a sporting stadium is the biggest barrier for an NBL return in Canberra. And on a broader scale, he says expansion is essential to strengthen our chances of another Olympic podium finish. So it's important, I think, and incumbent on federal, local and state governments to, to understand in order to grow the communities that these types of facilities are, are really important. And if we want to be uh, winning medals at the Olympics and World Cups and having our national team play at the highest level on a consistent basis, you need a, a, a really strong program at the, the national level to, to continue to develop the, the talent to have the capacity to, to play on the international stage. <laughs>